church. Praise God, church. Just before you sit down, let's um, honor uh, the prophet of God, our prophet, our mom, our Naomi. Mom, we honor you. We honor you, mom. We respect you. We acknowledge you as a gift in our lives and in this nation and other nations. Guest speakers from all over, within and outside Kenya, may I take this opportunity to honor you in Jesus' name. Our in-house ordained ministers, other ministers in the house, pastors, our firm partners, our international partners and co-workers, uh, I welcome you to this conference uh, in Jesus' name. And, and I'd like to acknowledge Mr. Gare. Thank you for escorting me today. God bless you. Bless you. So let's have our seats because I want to use my time very, very wisely this morning at this beginning of this conference and make some opening remarks. At the beginning of this year, our prophet mom gave us a prophetic word as she does at the beginning of every year. And she spoke from Ezekiel 34, 26 and said um, that it says this, I will make them and the places all around my hill a blessing and I will cause showers to come in their season. There shall be showers of blessings. That is the word that came forth. I also want to read Genesis 28, 15. This was the word from God to Jacob. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Other version says, until I have done what I promised you. Note the word return because I will come back to it later. But my point this morning, I want to bring an encouraging message this morning to encourage us at the beginning of this conference. Having read Genesis 28, 15, when God assured Jacob that he was with him and he would not leave him until he had performed all that he had promised him. This is a word to you and I this morning, that God will not leave us. He will go with us wherever we go. And he will ultimately return us to that place of promise and blessing until he fulfills what he has promised you and me. When I go through this um, uh, Ezekiel 34, 26, the word of the year, the prophetic promise of the year, I stand and I remind myself like God spoke to Jacob that God will not leave me. God will not leave you. He will not leave us. He will go wherever we go. His hand will continue to be upon us wherever we go, irrespective of our dysfunctions, our poor choices, our mistakes. He is committed to remain with us and his hand upon us until such time as he fulfills what he has promised us. I'm just making some opening remarks. So even though we may make some regrettable, unfortunate uh, regrettable choices that may initially distance us. You may make some poor choices, some bad decisions, some behaviors, habits, things in our lives that may initially distance you from the promise God has given you, from the showers of blessings. But ultimately, God is telling us through Jacob that ultimately he will make sure that he returns us to that place where we need to be so that he may fulfill his word and release the showers of blessings. What am I saying, church? God, in his mercy and in his grace and compassion, will create opportunities for you and me to be positioned and repositioned to the extent that the word will not fall to the ground. The showers will come, and we will be partakers of those showers. I have chosen to walk with this word and to believe that the showers that the prophet prophesied in Ezekiel 34, 26 are guaranteed. There's no question about it. It's not if. It is a question of they would definitely come and we will step under those showers of blessings. So if you are here today and you feel that the showers of blessings seem far or elusive 
and because you're in a dry place right now, a barren place, a place where you can't even visualize. You don't even have a visual of those showers at this point. I want to come here to encourage you. I want to encourage you this morning and to tell you, because I am persuaded beyond a shadow of doubt, that God's commitment, God's commitment to cause us to come to the place where we step under the promises and lay hold of the promises is greater than your mistakes, greater than your poor choices, greater than the enemy's attempts to hinder you from laying hold of those blessings and those promises. So I want you to walk with me this morning as I share this word. And I have chosen for my, for my, for my word this morning the character profile of Jacob. Why have I chosen Jacob? Personally, I feel often that I am a Jacob. I am like a Jacob. A Jacob are people who are dysfunctional. There's dysfunctions here and there. There is poor choices, poor mistakes along the way. And we may reach a point where we look like God has written us off. We look like we are beyond redemption. We are beyond retracing the steps back to the place of the blessings and the promise. But there is something about a Jacob. The favor of God, the hand of God remains upon a Jacob. If you are a Jacob this morning, be encouraged. Because the hand of God never left Jacob. Wherever he went, whatever he did, the mercies of God and the grace of God continue to be upon him all through his dysfunctional life until he was molded and made and shaped and brought back to the place where God fulfilled the promises over him. Now we know the story of Jacob. It pans from Genesis 25 to Genesis, uh, from, uh, right up to Genesis 35, 36, 37, it goes on. But I'm going to focus on certain portions. Now the promise of a Jacob was quite clear from the beginning, for those who may not be familiar. It was actually the covenant that God had made with his grandfather Abraham, then to his father Isaac, then to Jacob, that they'll come into abundance, that the people will bless them. Anyone who would curse them would be cursed. They would come into places of abundance. They would be fathers of nations where they come into abundance and plenty and be favored. They would be served and not serve. They would be above. Like you and I today, when we say that we are children of God, we have a promise that we are above and not beneath. Forever, the hand of God is upon us. So what happened to Jacob when God's hand remained in him throughout? God consistently reiterated and repeated that promise over him wherever he went, just to remind him that God was committed to fulfill his promise. And that's why I read Genesis 28, 15, when God told Jacob, when he was having the ladder experience on his way to Uncle Laban's, remember Jacob was a twin to Esau, his brother, for those who may not be familiar with the story. And they were, bo in the, they were, they were born at uh, the same time. They were twins. But Jacob was the one, uh, God spoke to the mother, Rebekah, and told Rebekah that Jacob, the younger, would be served by the older. God favored Jacob, and he shared that. He spoke that to Rebekah, the mother, that he had chosen Jacob over Esau. And what happened is Jacob, his mother, Rebekah, in her haste, and this symbolizes, Rebekah always symbolizes that part in us that wants to self-help, that wants to go ahead of God, Instead of believing the word God has spoken to you and allowing God to bring it to pass and to work it out, Rebecca is that aspect of us that seeks to help God, that seeks to run ahead and work things out ourselves. It, it represents the carnality and the flesh aspect of us that causes us to want to help God in our own kind of ways. So Rebecca tells her son Jacob, um, Isaac, your, Isaac, your father is about to go to pass. He wants to bless, obviously, the older one, who was Esau, who came out first. But Rebecca, forgetting or suspending the fact that God had already told her, Jacob is the one upon, the, upon whom I've put the blessing. She could have been patient and just let it work out. But she tells Jacob, we are going to deceive your father, Isaac. And she dresses him like Isaac, like Esau, 
and goes. And at the end of the day, as you remember the story, Isaac ends up blessing, putting the blessing upon uh, Jacob. And Jacob, with his mother, carried out a deception. A deception, a carnality, a fleshly act in an attempt to work things out. Yet God had already spoken. It, is, it was Jacob's blessing. He didn't have to fight for it. He didn't have to strive for it. He didn't have to deceive for it. But that's what happened. And at this point, Esau then discovers that his brother has deceived him. And he threatens to kill him. And that's a point where Isaac and Rebekah, the parents, tell Jacob, you have to run away. You have to go to your uncle Laban's in Padan Aram, where you'll be safe. Otherwise, your brother Esau will kill you. And he goes to Padan Aram, to the uncle Laban's, on his way there. And on his way there, he encounters the, the, the ladder experience, where he lay uh, on a rock, and he had this dream of vision. And God gave him the promise I will be with you. I will bring you back to this land, meaning Bethel. I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. God was assuring him, even though you've messed, even though you have to deposition yourself at this hour and go out into the wilderness. God is a wise God. The, 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 the going to Uncle Laban's was not wasted. God has a divine plan always. He orchestrates things in such a way that even if it's through my foolishness or your foolishness, he works it out in a way that that, uh, that visit to Uncle Laban served its purpose in molding and shaping and preparing Jacob for the ultimate promise that God had spoken over him. So he goes to Uncle Laban's, but a time comes at Uncle Laban's when he needs to come back. God tells him to come back. Why? Because the time had come when God wanted to revisit his word, his promise over Jacob, and bring him back to the place of the blessing, the place of the showers of blessings. And he speaks to him and tells him to exit Uncle Laban's. Now, I said earlier that a Jacob is that dysfunctional in this, in, in the, in the, in this, uh, in these uh, scriptures, we read of Jacob being a deceiver, a supplanter, a con man. Those are the labels upon him. A Jacob often is one who is considered dysfunctional. Uh, stigmas, negative stigmas. He, he just doesn't get it right at some point. He doesn't get it right at, at, at some point. But as I said, the favor of God remains upon him. The favor of God remains upon him. But that favor has a cost. That favor comes with a price. It comes with some price. Because if you see him at Uncle Laban's, God's hand continued to be upon him. And he did prosper. He did have showers of blessing to some extent. Not the full showers. Not the full blessings. But a time came when Laban's sons began to murmur and complain about Jacob because he was doing too well. As a Jacob, there will always be those who will murmur and complain against you because of the favor and the hand of God upon you. So it is during these times that we need to be careful not to sabotage ourselves when we find um, uh, Laban's sons coming against us, murmuring, complaining because of the hand of God upon us, because of the favor we are enjoying under the hand of God. But at that point, when Jacob has to start coming back, I want to share three things that on the way back from Uncle Laban's that Jacob had to do that finally ushered him into the place, returned him to Bethel, returned him to his original place of purpose, his place of a blessing where God told him to go back to your people, go back to Bethel, go back to the place, uh, to the place where I will fulfill my promise to you. And Jacob begins to come back. Now, three things I'm going to share this morning with you, church. One of the things that Jacob had to do, and you and I must do, as we walk into the showers of blessings, in the fullness of the showers of blessings, let us remember that even as we come to walk under and step into the showers of blessings, it doesn't mean we're not enjoying blessings. They are blessings. We are being blessed even now. Even before we can say you've laid hold of every prophetic promise over your life. There are showers. There are blessings. But the fullness, the fullness 
of the extent of the promises God has promised, there are certain steps we need to take to walk into that place. And my prayer is at the end of the three days out of this conference, we will be repositioned, repositioned to the place symbolically where God wants us to be mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. You see, with Jacob, it spoke of a physical relocation, a physical repositioning. Go back to Bethel physically. For you and me, it is symbolic. It is a returning to a symbolic place, an emotional heart condition, a, a, a symbolic a mental state or a mindset. God is calling us back into a particular mindset or an emotional heart condition and, and into returning back into a standing with God where we will lay hold of the promises and the showers of blessings on the assumption, just like with Jacob, that at some point in our lives, we may have stepped away, away from that relationship with God to its full extent, to its full measure. Or at some point, our mental thinking, our mindset may have shifted, shifted in a way that we need to reshift it back to align with God's mind, the mind of Christ, and our hearts. Maybe sometimes it's a weariness. It is the fatigue, the spiritual fatigue. The journey is long. There are attacks, battle fatigue. It is the discouragements, the disappointments. Sometimes those things we go through as we journey through destiny have a way, have a way of shifting our heart conditions, of shifting our mindsets, of bringing us to a place where we're not totally aligned, totally aligned with the plan and purpose of God. And for God to usher us into that place of the fullness of the showers and the blessings, we must then reposition our mindsets, our heart condition, our walk with God. The first thing, there are many steps that Jacob took, but I want to deal with only three. One of them was that he confronted and he prevailed over Esau, his brother. You and I must confront, prevail over our Esau's and I'll explain what our Esau's symbolize. An Esau is also a carnal choice. A poor choice we have made in the past that is carnal and in the flesh. That we need to redeem in order to go back to the place that God wants us to be of showers of blessings. The second thing is we must move on from a place called Sheshem. Sheshem was a place physically that Jacob came to, and he almost settled. It wasn't the final destination. Sometimes we are walking towards the prophetic promise, but we end up not quite getting there because we get tempted to stop on the eve. Shechem was a day's journey to Bethel. Bethel was the place he was to return to, the place of promise and the showers of blessings. But he stopped and was was tempted to almost settle there. And I'll explain this. These are the convenient choices we make. Because of convenience, we are tempted by, 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 by certain situations we see and we, we begin to make choices that are convenient, comfort zone choices that could abort, abort our ability to finish, to finish the instruction and go to Bethel. God said, go to Bethel. He was not told to settle at she Sheshem. And I'll speak about that shortly. The third thing is, he, uh, um, uh, uh, Jacob did, he came to a place where he buried and he burnt and buried all idols of his household and his family. But significantly, more significantly, he allowed his Rachel to die. He did not cause her to die. He allowed her to die. There are rituals in our lives that we must allow to die. That we may come into that place of purpose. Into that place of blessings and showers of blessings. So the title of my message this morning is the power of a prophetic promise. The power of a prophetic promise. What I'm putting to you church is that every prophetic promise promise over your life is so powerful. God's commitment to fulfill it 
is so strong that there's literally nothing that can stop it because we serve a God of mercy. And when we listen, he will order our footsteps towards redeeming anything we've gone wrong, anything we've done wrong, anywhere we've stepped out of line and bring us back into the straight so that we may lay hold of those blessings and showers. And, and I'm stressing this because I know like you and me, there are times we come to a place where the, 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 the enemy's power to, 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 to prevent you from laying hold of your promises and your own dysfunctional ways, sometimes we almost convince ourselves that those are more powerful than God's ability to bring us into the promise. I want us to change our minds this morning. I want us to see it the other way around. Look at it the other way around. Look at it from this perspective of saying there is such power in a prophetic promise that God's commitment for you to fulfill it, for, you, for him to fulfill it and for you to lay hold of it is greater, greater, far greater than the enemy's uh, hindrances or obstacles. And it is also greater than your own folly our own foolishness, our own mistakes and weaknesses. God has a way of enabling us to redeem, to redeem our bad choices, to redeem our dysfunctions, to redeem our weaknesses to the point where the promise he spoke comes to pass. So let's first look at the first point I said, where you have to confront and prevail over your Esau's. Your Esau, as Jacob journeyed back to the place of promise, God told him, leave Uncle Laban's, go back to Bethel. So he begins his journey to go back to the place of promise, the place of the showers of blessings, where God said, I will fulfill my word there. As he begins to do that, he knows very well that there is a past. There is an unresolved issue that he needs to confront and address and prevail over before he can get to Bethel. Your Esau's are those things that stand between us, between us and laying hold of our promises and laying hold of the showers of blessings. Esau physically, the brother, the twin brother of Jacob, stood between Jacob and Bethel, where Jacob needed to go and get his blessings. So that is, an, an Esau symbolizes and Esau symbolizes our past, your past mistakes, your past carnal and fleshly choices, your past fears and threats. Esau was a threat to Jacob because it was an unresolved issue where Esau possibly still had a grudge against Jacob. And that grudge and that fear and threat was standing between Jacob and his promises. Esau represents our past woundedness, issues internally, things that stand between us and our promises and our showers can either be external, they can be things that come from external, things that are afflicted against us by the enemy or by other people, or things that are internal, things that are within us, woundedness, unforgiveness, bitterness, or even mourning sometimes, just heavy, heavy, heavy darkness and baggage, excess baggage. Esau represents those things within us and around us that threaten to hinder us from fully laying hold of the promises that God has in store for us. Esau's, an Esau is a side of you because remember Rebecca was told by God, there are two nations within your womb. There are two nations within you. And we know that those two nations in terms of uh, uh, perception was Jacob represented the spiritual and Esau represented the flesh and carnality. So Esau is that side of you and I that often wants to rely on your own ability. It's a self-help side of us. It rears its ugly head once in a while. We know God will do it. We know God has promised it. We know he's the one with the power to do it. But there's something an Esau in us that often seeks to sneak out and help itself. Use a fleshly strategy, a fleshly method, 
a way to fulfill what God has already promised you. And it always fails because it's not by might, it's not by power, but it shall be by his spirit. So often that Esau represents that. That side of us that is motivated or driven by carnality and flesh, not by the spiritual, not by relying on God, not by dependence on God. Esau is also that nation within us that does not honor the spiritual things. Because even in the physical, in the story of Esau and Jacob, Esau failed to understand the significance of the spiritual blessing, the birthright. That's why he could so easily give it away for a bowl of soup. Your Esau is that aspect of you, God forbid, and me, that constantly almost forgets and undermines and does not really honor the spiritual. We focus too much on the outward, the physical, the, 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 the material things, the things out there. Because as, uh, we're often told that a word, a prophetic promise over your life, that word is much more powerful than material things. The word, will, that word will take you far. It will get you those material things in due season at the right time. So Esau represents that part of us that, that, that reaches a point where we begin to see the physical and the material things as more important and more relevant than the spiritual. And it is at that point we almost derail from our destiny, from our birthright, from our blessings. We need to be very careful about these Esau's in our lives. I'm speaking about you must encounter your Esau's and prevail over them in order to walk into and step under the showers of blessings. And God helps us to do that as we shall see in the story of Jacob. Jacob finally encounters Esau's. I want to show you the strategies that Jacob used in encountering and prevailing when he was confronting his brother. The word confront in this text is not aggression. I'm not talking of aggression. I'm talking about addressing. There are things you must confront and address. Things that are external, things that are internal, that you must address. And Jacob finally comes to the place where he's meeting his brother Esau physically. Now, the difference now, if you remember the Jacob of before, the Jacob before he went to Uncle Laban's, was a Jacob who was ready to use deceptive means without involving God. We don't see anywhere where Rebecca and Jacob, her son, consult God before they deceived Esau and Isaac. They took things in their own hands. The first time you and I may seek to prevail over Esau through a cunning deception, through our own fleshly strategies. But the second time Jacob encounters and confronts Esau, he is a completely different person. He has been to Penal. Remember the place of wrestling. He has been to Pinar, the place where he wrestled with God, and his identity crisis was addressed and sorted once and for all. His insecurities, his dysfunctions, anything that was in Jacob that was hindering him from laying hold of the promises of God was sorted out and dealt with at Penile, a place called Penile, where he wrestled with God. Wrestling with God at Penile also symbolizes when we come to a place in our own lives, when we wrestle with our inner selves, when you're trying to eject and uproot and come out of anything within you that is not of God, that is seeking to hinder you and sabotage your blessings. So Jacob was coming from that experience at Penile, where he had encountered God, he'd wrestled, and he'd been transformed. He'd been named, given a new name. He'd been uh, given an authority and a mandate. He was a more powerful, equipped person. So he comes to meet, but not in those scriptures. And these are scriptures that you're going to read in Genesis. When he comes to that place where he's about to encounter Esau, this time round, unlike the first time when him and his mother Rebecca deceived Esau, this time he is very careful to seek God. We are told that he went back and prayed. He sought God. 
Help me again. Help me in this situation. Protect me. I don't know what I'm about to walk into. I don't know how Esau will react. I don't know whether I'll be able to prevail over Esau or whether he'll prevail over me and destroy me and stop me from laying hold of that promise. This time he involved God. This time he knew only God could help him prevail over Esau. The previous time he thought his mother and her cunningness could help him prevail over Esau. But this time round, he acknowledges, he acknowledges the power of God and that from now on, anything he wants to succeed in must involve an inquiring of God, the God's protection. So we come to this place, and one of the things that um, Esau, uh, Esau offers to Jacob, he offers to lead him. If you read that entire chapter on confronting Esau in Genesis, end of 32, the beginning of 33, and a bit of 34, he is, Esau says, um, let me go ahead of you. Let me go ahead of you. He encounters Jacob with his family, his babies, his wives, his flock, and Esau offers, why don't I go ahead of you and lead you? Now, Jacob rejects that offer. And you know why? I told you that Esau represents your past, your past failures, your past fears, past woundedness and threats. Your past can never lead you to your future. Your past cannot purport to be ushering you into your promises. Jacob was very wise. He'd been through a brokenness at Penile. He'd been transformed. He had revelation. He now understood that there is no way I'm going to let my Esau, my past, my threats, my failures from the past, I'm not going to allow those to go ahead of me, to usher me into the place of promise and the place of the showers of blessings. He rejected that offer of where Esau was saying, we can lead you and go ahead of you. He rejected it. Jacob did not come with an aggression. You know, when we come to the place of having encountered God at Penile, anything we're going to prevail over will not be by a carnal aggression. It will be by a deep spiritual revelation, an authority, an authenticity, a mandate that God has deposited in us at Penile, at the place of wrestling. And we come out with such a, a, a quietness of authority, a quietness of, of mandate and understanding. And he came with this, and he comes, and he knows the answers. He knows the strategies to use in order to prevail over his brother. He didn't come there saying, at you, by the way, have you heard? I've been named, you know, I grew very rich while I was where. He didn't come with a show of attitude. He didn't even reveal his greatness at that point. He didn't even dare repeat, oh, don't you know there's a prophetic promise over me? God said, I think sometimes we make that mistake. You threaten your enemies, and there's a word over me. There's already a word over me, I'll be governor. There's a word over me, I'll be this. So he didn't. He had been broken. He had been broken. He had been molded and shaped to the extent where his authority, his inward authority he was carrying and the mandate are what helped him prevail because of these wise strategies. So he rejects that offer because he knew the purpose of encountering Esau was not so that they go back into a relationship. Get this right, child of God. It had nothing to do. We get back to a place of friendship. We start drinking tea together. We start putting our flocks together. Our families start having family Sunday. No. Jacob knew what he needed to do was to resolve the unresolved issues, the conflicts that he needed to resolve. It was a resolving. It wasn't a full-blown reconciliation. Often when we are hurt and wounded by people or situations, we, we make the mistake of thinking you're supposed to go back and be, remain buddies, best days. We must hear God when he's telling us, yes, it is godly for you to go and resolve the issue. Make peace with that issue, but do not reconcile and get bound with that issue. Jacob knew that this was a, an assignment where he needed to silence the threats that Esau represented. 
We are here. You come to that point where you are silencing every past dysfunction, every past woundedness, every past issue in your life that threatens you and your promises. So it's not binding yourself to that past. If Jacob had agreed to the offers Esau was making, he would have found himself back in a toxic relationship because by and by Esau would still be remembering. Yenyewe, the greatness would start coming out, and then you start remembering uh -huh, the way you deceived me. It wasn't a relationship that God wanted reformed or restored. Just to make peace with the past, a peace. He even bowed. When I read this issue about Jacob came and bowed seven times before Esau as he encountered him. And he made his wives and children bow before him and his servants. And initially it looks like, why are you bowing to your past? Why are you bowing to Esau? But this was a strategy. Remember Jacob's plan was to make peace and silence that toxic past that would have threatened him. So bowing, he was bowing with a revelation. The bowing is irrelevant. Considering that already has been spoken, that the younger shall be served by the older. So my bowing cannot come to confuse me. His bowing to Esau was not intended to in any way show that like he had surrendered or submitted to the past or submitted to serve Esau. It was symbolic. It was a wise, strategic action. Remember, he comes to appease, to silence the threat. And whatever he needed to do to silence that threat, whatever he needed to appease it, the bowing was a, 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 an appeasing to make Jake, to silence the Esau, to silence Esau, to put Esau in a place where he was no longer a threat, where he felt honored and almost like uh, respected so that he would not be a threat to Jacob. But when it came to the fundamentals of teaming up with Esau, teaming up their flock and their children, Jacob said no. The other offer that, uh, that Esau made was, why don't, we, why don't I give you some of my people, give you some of my people to go with you? He rejected that offer from Esau because Esau represents your past. It's a past you're coming out of and that you need to cross over to your promises. It is in between you and your promises. If he had accepted for Esau's servants and staff members to follow his co-workers, to follow him, that would have been a binding and a knitting and a returning to the past. Now, often when we are coming out of those past issues, we sometimes don't deal with everything. We deal with the anger, we deal with the unforgiveness, but we, we say the pride must stay because how am I going to survive in this marketplace? I must have some, some measure of kifua. I must have some kifua to get me through. So the lesson here, child of God, is we have no part in Esau. Esau must not have any part in us. We must reject every offer that Esau will make that would cause us to get back into a bondage, into a relationship that will become toxic and will threaten our promises as we go forward. Jacob answers very wisely. My the, my, the young ones, the young animals and the young children, we don't want to overdrive them because they will die. I want to take them slowly. Have you heard of this expression? Sometimes when you're watching movies and uh, people make up, they forgive each other, then somebody says something uh, cozy and somebody says, too soon. Have you heard the expression, too soon? Sometimes in a, in a reconciliation, or when you're dealing with resolving a conflict, you have to give it time. You can't immediately start being buddies. Let's go and eat nyamachoma. Let's go and have lunch. Let's go swimming. You have to not rush. Don't rush the healing and the, and the resolving. You cannot rush it and suddenly become bound in that friendship as if it is a restoration. Jacob had come from Peniel where he had been transformed, equipped, and empowered with wisdom that enabled him to answer his brother Esau so wisely. He used such, strategic, he used such strategies that were enabled. Now, the other thing I want us to note here, without Peniel, the place of wrestling, 
the place of getting a new name, the place of dealing with his identity crisis, the place of letting go of every lack of confidence, low self-esteem, fears and unbeliefs and doubt. Because if you remember, this is the same Jacob on his way to Uncle Laban's at the ladder experience. He was talking of if, if God does this for me, if God does this. It was a Jacob who still had elements of doubt in the promises of God. But on the way back after the penile experience, he was able to confront, address the unresolved issues with Esau and prevail over because of that equipping at penile, that identity, that legitimacy, that credibility. Remember at penile, God gives him a name, removes the stigmas, the negative labels, the negative stigmas, con man, supplanter, you know, useless, you cannot be trusted. There are certain dysfunctions and labels that we, people may give us over time. Some of them were earned because of things we did. But at penile, God strips and removes all those negative stigmas, all those negative labels. Some of them are, are as a result of something we did. But most of them are as a result of false accusations. False accusations, uh, misunderstandings, jealousies and envies. People bandica you with certain stigmas. Jacob's ability to deal with Esau, his past, um, was because he had just been named. He had been named and given authority and legitimacy and the credibility. He arose there knowing who he was born to be. Prior to that, Jacob was walking around, even at Uncle Leber's, he was walking around and doing things without really having a full revelation of who he was born to be, who he was in God. Whenever we walk around and we do things without a full revelation of who we are in Christ, who we are in God, there's very little we can defeat in our lives. But the minute we come to that revelation, I am a child of the Most High God. I am the righteousness of God through Christ. I am the head and not the tail. Once you come to that revelation of who you are and who God is, you get some kind of authority. You walk around with an authority, a credibility. You, the identity crisis has been resolved. You're not guessworking. You're not guessing you're this to God. or you're this. You know who you are in God. And that is what empowers and equips us to confront and prevail over our past, our dysfunctions, anything standing between us and the showers of blessings, we will be able to prevail over and overcome as a result of having been through that place of identity, that place of being reborn, the place of being renamed in Genesis 32, 24 to 29. You cannot effectively confront and overcome your issues until you have properly been redefined. You've been redefined. You've been broken before God. You've accepted that God's authority in your life, the dependence upon God. We see Jacob, a new person. His dependence of God was clear, crystal clear. Unlike before, when he was doing self-help projects, trying to get his blessing on his own. The past stigmas and labels had been removed. And he was able to confront and overcome uh, uh, Esau, because he now knew who he was. Our true identity in God empowers us. It is what empowers us to overcome doubt and fear and unbelief and all manner of things and fake identities, wrong identities that hinder us from our blessings. Now Jacob, the Jacob in you must be broken, redefined and packaged to, to actually silence anything that we need to rear its ugly head to keep you away. I said favor comes at a price. As favored children of God, we are like Jacobs. We are favored of God, but we're not perfect. And what happens is, as we continue on this journey towards our promises, we will encounter jealousies and envies and false accusations and all manner of attacks by Esau's and Laban's sons. Ebos and Lab Laban's sons and Esau's will always be those things and those people in your life that seek to deter you, to hinder you, to threaten your promise, to threaten you from getting to your promise. And you must overcome 
but only after the renaming and the brokenness. Now, the other thing that happened to when he encountered Jacob or Esau, he came to a place where he kept his distance. We are told that even in, a reconcilia in, in a resolving conflicts, you're not supposed to get back into that friendship and get caught up in the past toxicity, the toxic emotional bondages in it. So he, he separated himself and he told Esau to go. We will go ourselves. He was very wise. He took charge. He took charge of his own destiny and his own future without getting entangled with the past that Esau represented. Next point is where Jacob came to a place called Sheshem. This is in Genesis 34. Remember the word was, go to Bethel, return to Bethel. But he came to a place called Sheshem, and this was a place where he even bought land. He almost settled there. It had disastrous consequences. When we partially obey, when we don't fully obey the instruction of God, as we're walking towards the showers of blessings, there is always a danger that we will, we will walk in partial obedience. We will stop at a place which looks convenient. Sheshem was convenient. It was one day's journey to Bethel. Jacob set, almost settled there. He, uh, uh, he camped there. He bought property there. And there were disastrous consequences. Because it was at Sheshem that his daughter Dina was raped by one of the princes, a young prince from the Sheshem clan. And then Jacob's sons, Levi and Simeon, revenged. And they went, they strategized, they told the Sheshemites, you, you need to be circumcised like us so that you can be like us, we can intermarry. Because the Sheshem young prince was saying, give me dinner for my wife. Even though I've done this bad act, just give her to me so that she can be my wife. And they knew, of course, they were not supposed to intermarry. But what they told the Sheshemites, it was a strategy and a trick. You are the ones, you must be circumcised like us, the Jewish godly way, so that you can be like us and then we can intermarry. But it was a trick. And what happened was that in the process of doing that, they tricked them. And on the third day of the circumcision, when the Sheshemites were weak, very weak and sickly, Jacob's sons came and slaughtered them. There was a bloodbath in Sheshem. And Jacob was angry with his two sons for doing that. And we're told that he cursed them. And later on, the tribe of Levi and Simeon kept uh, uh, the curse of being divided and separated. It wasn't necessary for the father, Jacob, to come to a place where he'd end up cursing his sons. Why? Because he did not fully obey the instruction to go to where he was supposed to go. Sheshem was not a place to dwell. It is not your destination. It is a convenient choice. It is a choice you make that is a comfort zone, that is convenient. He bought land. It was a commercial center. He saw the price of land was cheap. You know, he settled there. And without remembering, the instruction was return to Bethel. Let's be careful. When God gives us an instruction, let's be careful to obey it fully. Full obedience, not partial obedience. Because the place of partial obedience or partial disobedience is a place called Sheshem, where you will find yourself with disastrous consequences. What a pity that Jacob had to curse his sons instead of blessing them at a, a point of a place like this because of a wrong choice, a convenient choice by Jacob. In fact, at Sheshem, the good thing that Jacob did there was where he told his household. Because Sheshem also symbolizes and represents settling for less. Bethel was the full-blown showers. That's where the full promise was going to be. Sheshem was not the final destination. It is where you'll get partial blessings. You'll get only a portion of what you would get in Bethel, the place of promise and blessings. So we, sometimes we miss the full blessings and the full showers because we have stopped short of obeying God fully and walking right up to where he has told us, getting rid of everything we need to get rid of. Sheshem symbolizes a settling for less than what God has for you. 
You come to a place of comfort zone. It looks okay. The land is okay. You start settling for that position, that job, that business, that relationship, whatever it is. But yet God has something bigger and greater for you at Bethel. Let us be careful of settling for less. Let us be careful that on the eve of our breakthrough, because Sheshem was a day's journey to the final destination, let us be careful that at the eve of our breakthrough, we do not settle. We do not make convenient choices, comfort zone, where we miss the full blessings. The third thing that Jacob did and you and I need to do is to let our Rachel's die. Rachel symbolizes your emotional choices that are motivated purely by outward appearance. That thing looks nice. Rachel was beautiful outwardly. Later is when Jacob discovered her inwardness, when she was almost slaughtering him to give her a child. The inner character he had not known. Often when we are enticed by the outward appearance of things, we settle, we get bound by those things. They become idols. They become idols. It's idolatry. They, they bind us. They blinded us. Why would Jacob continuously sit there helplessly while his wife Rachel and his other wife Leah were in a toxic competition naming his son's ridiculous names, ungodly labels, stigmas? Why would he? He was blinded. Rachel will always blind you to your authority and your mandate. He was the father of the home. He should have been naming his sons. But he was blinded. The outward appearance, the beauty of Rachel, an idol. Rachel represents an idol. Rachel represents an obsession. An obsession with a position, a business, a title, a ministry, anything. It can be something that you're so in love with. You love it. You're obsessed with it. That it takes the place of God. It takes the place where you need to hear God. You don't inquire of God concerning it. So you end up being bound and blinded. Rachel was the same Rachel who stole her father's foreign gods. You remember the idol gods? Without Jacob's knowledge, she hid them. So, and, and she didn't disclose it to Jacob. Jacob did not know she had done that. Rachel is that part of us that wants to seek the true God, yes. But there's another part of us that also wants to consult. You want to go to Kawangware and consult where you're told you have to have a, uh, uh, there's a place I went, Kitambo, before I met mom. <laughs> we had gone with my friend. We had just come from the UK from university. So we went, went, went. We were told there's a woman who prays for people who are still like not born again. We went, we went, we went. We were told to sit down. You know these crochet tablecloths? She said, you must put on your head before I, 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 I prophesy. So we were put those to crochets on our heads. Our posh here, we had come from the UK, so we had posh wigs. So we were put those to cloths. And then she gave us words that, of course, were not true. They were nowhere near the truth. In fact, she told my friend, my friend would marry the man she was with, the boyfriend she had at the time. Me, I would not marry the one I was with. I ended up marrying the one I was with. How she didn't marry the one. So... <laughs> What am I saying? A Rachel is an aspect of us that, yes, we'll come to church, we'll obey the scriptures, but it's as another aside where we'll go and seek another God, where we'll seek another power. That's a Rachel. Rachel is that thing that threatens you and your promises. Stealing of the idol gods by Rachel, hiding even the fact from Jacob, was literally threatening his destiny. It was threatening his ability to enter Bethel. Because when they came to Sheshem, he told his household, all your foreign gods, every idol thing, we must burn it at Sheshem and bury it. He didn't even want to talk of burying alone. Burying would not have been enough. He wanted to burn and bury, destroy every idolatry before he could enter into Bethel the place of promise. As we walk towards the place of showers, the showers of blessings, the place of promise, we must make sure that every Rachel, every idolatry, every obsession, anything that has taken the place of God, anything we're inquiring from instead of inquiring from God, anything that is derailing and distracting us, it must be burnt and buried at Sheshem. And that's what Jacob did. So Rachel... 
didn't disclose. Even up to that point, she's not disclosing she has those two foreign gods. She's still misleading Jacob. She stands, she symbolizes a threat. Someone or something in your life that has a hidden agenda that is threatening you and your destiny and you do not know. Relationships in our life that have, like Jonah's, it's like a Jonah. They are with you and they want to enter the promises with you, but they have not yet complied with God's requirements. This is what Rachel was. Rachel was a relationship in Jacob's life that was threatening his promises and his blessings, threatening his future and his destiny by harboring and holding on to the idol gods. And ultimately, poetic justice, Rachel goes to give birth. And when she's giving birth, she, die, she, she, she starts dying, losing her, uh, uh, it says that her soul was going out of her. And she brought forth a son. And in her Id idolatriness, remember she used to, they used to name children with Leah, at, because God has now looked at me, because my husband has loved me. Uh, careless, negligent naming of children. <laughs> careless, literally careless. What happened is now, she continued, you can see she had not been transformed because she continues to name the child she has brought forth, son of my sorrow. Naming it according to a circumstance. We must not allow circumstances, circumstances, no matter how adverse, but to name, to name our future. That son she was birthing was symbolized Jacob's future, Jacob's destiny, Jacob's strength, Jacob's uh, gifts, and Jacob, because he had been to Peniel, because he had wrestled with God, he had wrestled with his inner self, he had come to a place of getting a proper true identity in God. He had come to a place of being transformed and broken, depending on God. He now had authority. He had the mandate and the credibility to just arise and change and revoke that careless name. You see, it's a different Jacob. Why hadn't he stood up before when they were naming careless names? He hadn't been to Peniel. He hadn't been named. His true identity had not been addressed and dealt with. In fact, Jacob needed to be named by God. He needed to be given his identity, his true identity, in order for him to have the mandate and the authority and the credibility to name his son. You cannot name something, your future or, or your gift, when you yourself have not been dealt with in terms of your identity. His own identity needed to be addressed, and he comes to a place of authority, authenticity, um, uh, credibility and mandate, then only then could he step in there, take over from Rachel and name Benjamin. He will not be called Benoni. Rachel had called him Benoni, son of my sorrows. Those careless namings. But Jacob rose up, a new Jacob from Peniel, and he said, he shall not be son of sorrow. His name is Benjamin, the son of my strength, the son of my right hand. And he named him with authority. Because this was his future. He took back his authority. He took back his mandate, his identity. And he was able to over, overrule, overrule Rachel. And this is at the point at which Rachel died physically. What am I saying? Your Rachels must die. For you to arise in authority. For you to exercise your identity in God. Use that identity to decree and declare. As long as Rachel remains alive, she will always threaten your future. She will threaten where you're going. She will stand between you and your promises. They could not have entered Bethel when they were still defiled. In fact, Jacob tells them, purify your, burn and bury the idols, number one. Then he tells them, purify yourselves. Get rid of any toxicity, any emotional baggage, any hurt, any woundedness any anger issues, anything, emo anything that can, is defiled in you, purify yourselves. And this is where he knew that they could not enter Bethel, the place of the showers of blessings, the place of, 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 the, of the promise, without purifying themselves, checking, purging their motives, purging their agendas, checking into themselves, self taking a self-stock to check what, 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 where am I at? 
in terms of my perception, my attitude. The other thing he told them is, change your garments. Change your garments. Before they could enter Bethel, the place of promise, the place of the showers of blessings, they had to change their garments. Garments symbolize your attitudes, our mindsets, wrong mindsets. They symbolize, um, garments always also symbolize culture. Whatever cultures they had gotten from Laban's place, those idolatrous cultures, traditions that are not aligned to the purpose of God, any tradition, any culture, any mindset, any emotional heart condition, anything whatsoever that was within them or they had clothed themselves with that would hinder them from entering into the place of promise, into the place of your showers of blessings. They had to change their garments, their mindset. You may be here and you're at a place where you feel, I don't qualify for those showers. If only you knew where I'm at. If only you knew what I'd done. Sometimes we, we, we may have come to a place where, you know, tiredness, the journey can make you weary. This journey to destiny. You know, this journey to destiny can make you weary. You can be battle fatigued. You can come to a place where your mindset becomes distorted. You begin to think you don't qualify for showers. At maybe it's other people who are being told they qualify for showers. That's a wrong mindset. Your heart is so hurt and wounded, disappointments that it hasn't yet softened and, and, and embraced that, yes, I can step into the showers. And this is what God is calling us to do. Change our mindset from a wrong perception, negativity. Oh, me, I'm not entitled, me, I can never get. Or a heart that is so hardened, that is so hurt and wounded, that it's not open to receive what God is speaking to us and to embrace the showers of blessings. Those, for them, it was physical. Burning and burying the idols, purifying themselves, changing their garments. That was actually physical. Kujiosha kabisa and to change whatever they were wearing. For us, it's symbolic. It is in the mind. It is in our heart. Our walk with God. Coming to a place where all that the right, even rebuilding the altars of prayer in our lives. Rebuilding the altars of the word. Reading of the word. Immersing ourselves in the word. Rebuilding the altars of fellowship. Do not forsake fellowship. Have we forsaken fellowship? Have we come to a place where our prayer, our, our prayer place, the altars are broken? Do we need to rebuild the altars of prayer in our lives and the reading of the word? And immersing ourselves in the things of God. We need to come to a place where we let our Rachel's die. Rachel symbolizes our emotional choices that threaten to blind us uh, and, and to obsess us and consume us. It's, it, it, they are idols, idolatry. Jacob loved Rachel. And you know this love of his, almost, I mean, after all, Leah became the, the one who was fruitful. You don't even see the logic. The one you are loving is not fruitful. You know, th that thing we are, we are consumed with, that bondage we hold, that thing of outward appearance we're holding on to may not even be producing. That business may not even be fruitful. And yet there's something else on this other side that is fruitful and producing. But we are blinded because of an obsession and because of an idolatry. We must let our Rachel's die. Rachel had a conflicted faith. That's why she held on to those idol gods. She had to die so that they could enter, so Jacob could enter into the place of promise. The newborn son, Benjamin, symbolized Jacob's future as he entered into his place of promise. It symbolized where God was taking him, the strength. He said, the son of my strength, the son of my right hand, entering his place of promise with strength, with strength and hope. And Jacob was able to take back and reclaim his authority from Rachel, and he was able to move on without Rachel because Rachel died. And he was able to enter into his promises and to uh, lay hold of that which God had promised him. I will not leave him. I will go with you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to the place of promise. What is God speaking to us this morning? That we need to look at, we need to believe. I told you I am persuaded beyond a shadow of doubt that this word the prophet spoke to us is guaranteed. I'm not going to take any half measures. I'm not going to say if, where, how. No. It's a promise. There is power in a prophetic promise. God's commitment to fulfill it is more powerful than our own dysfunctions. He's a merciful, compassionate God. He will always give us a way, a way of escape, a way of redemption. 
a way to redeem our wrong choices. Jacob was redeeming wrong choices. His wrong choice with Jacob, with Esau. His wrong choice with Rachel. Every wrong choice he did, he was able to redeem those wrong choices and still enter into his place of promise and lay hold. So there is a hope this morning for us to believe in that word. The word must be fulfilled. We must lay hold of the showers. It's the guarantee. There's no question about it. We just need to be sensitive and allow God to enable us to redeem wrong choices, to return to the place symbolically through mindset shifting, through heart condition changing, and a shift in our walk with God that we may come to that place of our showers and blessings. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Mom, for that opportunity, giving me and entrusting me with a microphone. We don't take it for granted, Mom. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Blessings, blessings, blessings. Thank you so much. Who is to take the microphone? <laughs>